And our sermon text is going to be found in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 25. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you for a morning that we can open your word. And we can hear from it. And we can know that you, with great power, stand ready uh, to apply this word to our hearts, to convict us of sin, and to convince us of the great gift that you've given us in giving us your power toward us and your spirit in us. And that you mean, through this power toward us, uh, to work in us and through us in this world. And we pray, God, that we would... Uh, understand and grasp in a more significant way just what you mean to do through us, and that part of us will be scared to think about how much you mean to do through us, and then part of us will just be excited that your power is there uh, to make up for our weakness and to do things through us beyond what we could ever do on our own. We praise you for an opportunity to open your word, and we pray that you would just bless uh, the preaching and the hearing of your word uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are here in uh, this, really the end of Ephesians chapter 1. We've been spending some time uh, in Ephesians 1, and we've uh, come now, we're really on the second part of looking at this section, uh, verses 19 through 23. Uh, last week, we, uh, uh, and the, the main idea behind this section is that you have a leader, it's God, uh, who is powerful, and he's for your good. Uh, and last week, we, we, we did the first half of the sermon. We talked about how uh, God uh, has power to effect eternal realities. Um, and we spent some time marveling at the depth of humility that Jesus underwent in order to save our souls. Right? He, he, he went all the way to the cross, and he was, he was dead. And that from that state of of having died from our sins, God raised him from this low humility to a place of great exaltation. And part of what we were doing there is we were reflecting on the marvel of our salvation and the great glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And at the same time, what we were also supposed to do is notice, wow, if, if this from, from humility to exaltation happened, how did it happen? And the answer is the mighty power of God. And that is, of course, something that you can marvel at, you can worship the Lord for. And yet, the, the point of this text, and one of the main things you need to get from this text, is this mighty, powerful God is for you right now. He means to work in, the power is toward you now. So if, if you feel like you're stuck or you're not that effective in your Christian life, it's not because God's power isn't for you. Be encouraged. <laughs> Mighty things, amazing things can happen in your life and through you. Not depending on you and your abilities, but on God and his mighty power that is for you. We turned then to reflect for just a few minutes at the end of our sermon last week on how God is powerful to lead his own. We rejoiced to think about this idea that the head of all things, right, so that's what Jesus is, he's the head of all things, head of everything on heaven, everything on earth, the head of all things, this mighty powerful leader, he gave the one who is head over all things to be head of the church. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> the amazing idea that the head of everything, right, God could have put him anywhere. 
head of mighty kingdoms or something like that, you might think. And instead, he's the head of the church. And so we rejoiced to think of this. And we began to reflect on how important the church is on this earth. It's way more important than unbelievers understand. And as a matter of fact, the church is way more important than most believers seem to understand. Sometimes we think the most important things on earth happen through the earth's wisest and most powerful and the richest people, but God disagrees. And he demonstrates that by placing over the most exalted king, Jesus Christ, over the church and leading the likes of you and me. And so we see that God's plan for this world will be a foolish plan according to the world's way of thinking of things. And yet he puts Jesus Christ over the church to lead us. And we're praying then that God would lead us to value the church as much as God does. And to think that God thinks a difference will be made in the world through the church. And for you to think, how can you, with your life, make a difference in the world? And if the church isn't a big part of that, then you're not connecting yourself with the way that God means to bless the world. If you want to spend your life pouring into all kinds of other more important things than the church, you you just don't understand that God is doing very important things in this world, and he's doing it. He means to do it through the church. And so you should value the church and understand how God thinks of it, And think your your best efforts are not spent outside of the church. Although we're not discouraging you from working outside of the church. Clearly, many of us will. But but connecting yourself to this body that God means, uh, through, through which God means to do amazing things in this world. And to think as we reflect on his mighty power that it's there for a purpose. Why did he give all this power to the church? Why why is all this power toward us to believe? Well, because he wants to change you and he wants to work through you. And to this we turn our attention now. We continue then with this this power to lead his own. And I just want to look now at verse 23. It says here in verse 23, after it says, well, I should just read that last part of verse 22. So, uh, he gave him as head over all things, that's Jesus, head over all things, to the church. And then says this of the church, which is his body. This is an amazing statement. Uh, We are the body of Christ. Jesus is willing then, what what we should get from this, one of the things we should get from this is that Jesus is for us. He is willing to do whatever it takes for the church to succeed. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, Jesus is not just the leader of the church. He's personally invested in the church. He he closely identifies with us. He purchased each one of us with his own blood. He remains closely associated with us with his power ready to do us spiritual good. And he explains that we are not merely his close friends, but we are his very body. Remember what, uh, what uh, Jesus said to, to Saul when he was going to persecute more Christians. He says, why do you persecute me? It meant that there's a close connection between the way Christ identifies with us, the church. And since we are his body, it means that he's not indifferent to our spiritual health. When, t- when teaching on how husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, right? it says this in Ephesians 5.29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So we are cherished by Christ. You are cherished by Christ. And Christ means to nourish you. He means you to become stronger spiritually. Your faith to be stronger. That's his his desire for you, for you to have stronger faith. Jesus takes personal interest in your spiritual health. And he gives you the, the nourishment you need to not be a spiritual weakling. His power is toward you for this sort of maturity that he means to see in us. And this idea of the body as taught in the Bible points to 
mutual responsibility. Now, at this point, I just want to talk a little bit about what it means for us to be the body of Christ. And, and we have responsibilities, yes, toward Christ, but actually toward each other. And this comes up many times in Scripture. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individual members of one another. And that idea is explained even a little bit more when we look to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's this description of some of you might be a foot, and some are a hand, right? And we all have different parts. Somebody's the eye, each having their own purpose, but they're all supposed to work. Why? According to 1 Corinthians 12. For the health of the body. Right? You, you are here to make the body of Christ at Stony Hill more healthy spiritually. And again, we can't say then we don't need a particular part. We can't say, oh, I don't need old so-and-so. We, don't, we can't think that way about any particular person. Nor can we remain healthy if each part does not do their part for spiritual health. I'm just using this example. What's my hand for? Well, I mean, lots of things, but I mean, if it's not going to cooperate and actually put food in my mouth, it's, it's not only not working toward the overall health of my body, it's actually getting in the way. <laughs> Makes life harder. There's a workaround for my right hand to not put food in my mouth. It's called the left hand. But if they both go on strike, right, I mean, so, so you can see here, this is the picture you're supposed to have in your mind. You are here to do something, to some way act so that your presence makes the body of Christ at Stony Hill healthier. And here it is essential, again, that we have unity, that there might not be disunity in the body. Members have the same care for one another. Again, God is so arranged that the spiritual health of our church depends on each one doing their part to work for the spiritual good of the whole. I thought to give you an example about this, it's just one of those ways, uh, the, the ways that I have been helped to think about this have largely been through the scriptures, but I wanted to give you one example of this that just uh, came to mind over the past couple weeks as I've been reflecting on the importance of the church and God's program. And so uh, it, it relates to this couple uh, that Adrian and I met when we were uh, first married. Uh, their names were Daryl and Cindy. Uh, they were uh, w wonderful folks. They, they were members of the church that we joined. Uh, they seemed, you know, so mature. They were, you know, they probably were only about 10 years older than us, but they had kids and we were just married. And so it just, everything seemed brand new to us. And, and they taught us so many things about what it meant to be a meaningful part of a body of Christ and to help other people grow. And I, I would actually have a very hard time teaching you all the things that they taught us. And they didn't really teach us by like coming over and saying, I have a Bible study on how new married people can really, you know, have a successful marriage. They didn't do any of that. They just opened their home. They, they, they first showed us, they modeled, they modeled most everything. They modeled hospitality. Right? They had an open invitation. They just made a big pot of soup, and if you wanted to come over on a Sunday, you just come on over. And so we, we came over somewhat regularly, we would, and then we would just sit at their table, and we would see him taking a spiritual leadership role at his family's lunch table, leading a conversation about maybe what the sermon was about, and, and talking kindly to his wife and to his kids about the Lord. And she modeled just respecting her husband and loving him. And, and, he, and then sometimes we would go, well, you're doing something we haven't seen a lot. You know, you're talking to your kids. And, and he would talk to us about how he read the Bible with his children. And all of these things were not lessons that he needed to teach us. He just opened his life up and lived his life. He wasn't putting on airs for us. He was just being him. And yet, I learned lots about what it means to be a good husband, a good father, a, a faithful church member, uh, through just watching this guy. And he, he, he hadn't gone to Bible college, right? He, hadn't, he, he wasn't paid to be a pastor. He was just a guy who loved Jesus and was just living out the Christian life the best he understood it. And he just, you know, he thought, well, this, this young seminary couple probably doesn't have much money and could use a place to eat, and I'll let him eat, and, 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 and lots. Again, it would be hard to tell you everything we learned and, and we're able to bless to see. You know, one of the lessons, though, that, uh, that 
as he wasn't intentionally trying to teach us everything. One of the things that took me a few years to figure out was just this way that he had a high value on the meeting of Christ's body on a Sunday. One of the things I noticed, and like I said, it took a few years, was that he, he when, the, when his family went on vacation, and by the way, this doesn't have to become a rule for you, but this was something that I thought was helpful. When his family went on vacation, he would normally, he, you know, the, the normal pattern, and this was even my pattern, if I have, you know, five days off, I'm going to basically take both weekends and be gone, and he did this odd thing of he would you know, get off work on Friday. He didn't have to go to work for a whole week and a half. And he would stay home on Saturday and on Sunday and leave on Monday. And then when he came back, he wouldn't come back on Sunday. He'd come back on Saturday, say noon. And I thought, now that is a waste of a good vacation. That's what, that was my thought, right? I had very few vacation days. But I did think to ask him. I was like, why do, you, why do you do that? And he said, look, I know this was his way. And I, again, I'm not holding this out to you. I just want to say that it made an impact on me. He said, you know, I mean, the Lord, the Lord knows that I could go, when I go on vacation, I could go to church anywhere. And yet he felt such a strong sense that he was supposed to be here in his church for the good of that church. That he, he, It's not like he never broke the rule. He would sometimes be gone, but he needed a really compelling reason. And if it was just two extra days of vacation, he was fine to give those up because he knew that he needed to be, and the Lord had put him in that church, to be a blessing. And, and, and to me, that always just made me think it's not a foregone conclusion that you should just lightly consider your missing of the church service on the Sunday. And to me, that's a good pushback. Again, I don't want to make this a rule. I still don't make this a rule. You may notice I'm normally not here on a Sunday, so you don't have to make this a rule, right, on the Sundays that I'm off, I should say. I'm, I'm mostly here every Sunday that I'm preaching, at least. Okay, so I just totally lost something really good there. So, um, I tell you this that because today so many people put a very low priority. You know, what, what, it, what does it take to skip church? Well, you know, the kids, they had a sports thing today, or maybe we were out late on Saturday night, we were just dog tired, or, you know, our, our life is just really busy, and we, we, our, we, our Saturdays are full, so we just, sometimes we just take Sunday to for us, and, and I get that, I, I understand how challenging life can be, <laughs> and yet I just think it's a good pushback to say, don't think so lowly of the church and the role that the Lord means for you to play here for the spiritual good of the body, that you just think, well, you know, it's a pretty low standard of what it would take for me to skip on a Sunday. I think that sort of pushback that, that he, and he wasn't, he, he, didn't, he didn't bring this up, he was just... I asked him, but I, I find that to be a helpful thing, and I think it cl- closer matches, at least in my view, as I've been thinking about the value that the Lord puts on the church, it closer matches the Lord's estimation of, you, of what you mean uh, to this local congregation and what he means for you to do when you meet week by week. Well, I just think this would be a good time then uh, not to reflect mainly on the life of this couple, but to reflect on God's word and what's been saying. Uh, to us about uh, God's meaning to work through you uh, in this church, it would be a good time to ask yourself how you are contributing to the spiritual health of the church body at Stony Hill. How's that going? Can you think of ways that you are contributing in ways that are helping other people be spiritually strong? Or might you think that through failure to do what God has gifted you to do, he's given you a gift, through failure to do what God has gifted you to do, that you're part of the explanation about why we lack a certain measure of spiritual health. I don't think this is a spiritual unhealthy church, but we, if, if somebody's not doing their part to that extent, we, we, we lack the health that could be brought by that gift being used in this body. But we have to keep moving on. We need to also consider the fact that G, when we consider that Jesus is the head of the body, it means that we depend on Jesus. We must consider the sustaining influence of Jesus as our head, right? A body needs a head in order to be healthy, right? A headless man, sort of odd to even think about, but you wouldn't say that that was healthy. And, and once the head is there, what you also recognize is that the, what it takes to nourish the body comes through the head. And I think the idea that you'd want to think about is kind of what Jesus talks about in John 15 about the vine and the branches. 
right? In, in John 15, it says, Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And in the next verse, it says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so what we need to think about is that we need the head. We need Christ. And we need to be nourished. We need to be strengthened by our connection to Christ. He's not just the one who's in charge. He's the one who gives us the necessary nourishment for our faith to remain strong. This is an important emphasis, I think, in this text. You need something from Christ week by week for your faith to remain strong. The the, the point is made elsewhere. Uh, Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We're supposed to grow up into Christ as our head. I'm going to skip that and move down to Ephesians or Colossians 2, 19, making a similar point. And not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together, the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, growth, grows with a growth that's from God. Your spiritual growth has to come from God. You need to be connected to Christ who's the head, and he will give you what you need to spiritually thrive. And this, I think, is the best understanding of this next phrase at the end of verse 23. Let me just read it. After it says, which is his body, then it says, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, there is some disagreement about how to best understand this statement, and I'll give you two understandings. I think they, they, I think they work with each other, but let me work on this one first. Jesus is the full one who fills you. I don't know if that statement seems important to you. Let me say it again, though. Jesus is full, and then he takes from himself and fills you. So the picture that I maybe want you to get is imagine that you're a car broke down on the side of the road, right? And you're out of, and the the problem is that you're out of gas, right? Your car is running out of gas, you're stuck, and along comes a tanker truck, right? A gas tanker truck, just full of, of, of what you need to get your car going, and that tanker truck comes up beside you, stops, and then from the fullness of the tanker truck, It puts into your vehicle what your car needs to go on down the road. And this is the the picture, the picture that you need to get. And that Jesus, from his fullness, he's full of great things. He will, from his fullness, put into your life the things you need to thrive spiritually. Now, let me give you some texts that teach this. First on the word fullness, John 1, 16 says this, and from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, right? Jesus is full, with, full of goodness, and from him who is just filled to the brim of goodness, he's got goodness to spare, and he will, out of the goodness that's in him, put goodness into every one of you, and really to every believer that's ever lived. There's so much fullness in Christ. But he means to give us from what's inside of him and put it inside of you. Ephesians 4.13 makes a similar point. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, this idea that we, we need to closer attain to that. We won't fully get there, but can we get closer to the fullness, to his fullness? Can we get there? That's a sense of what the Lord is up to in us. Another passage along this line covers both this idea of fullness and him filling us. And that is Ephesians 3.19. He's praying for them that they would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that they would be filled with the fullness of Christ. Again, there's fullness of Christ, and he wants the people to be filled with the fullness of Christ. I could go on and on. There's just many pictures in the Bible that speaks about the fact that you lack something. You, you, I don't know if you know it, but you lack something. Something essential to your spiritual life, and the only place to give it, to get it, is from Jesus. 
And he is full of all the things you need to be spiritually healthy. Let's skip a few verses that make the same point. Well, I can't. <laughs> these are important. Let me, let me just walk you through a few of these verses. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace. So what God can give you, what he has inside of him, is joy and peace. And you lack joy and peace. Does anybody in this room feel that they lack joy or peace? Don't you long for joy and peace? And don't you know that you can only get that from the one who is full of joy and peace, who can pour that into you? Philippians 1.11, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Don't you want to be righteous? I mean, part of you, I mean, part of you, yeah, we still have a sinful nature, but we want to be better. We want to be kinder. We want to be nicer. We want to be more useful than we are. And we're like, who, who could give me righteousness? Who, the one who is full of righteousness. And he will fill you. Colossians 1, 9. Filled with the knowledge of his will. You're like, I don't even know what to do in this situation. He knows. He knows how to handle that situation at work. That rebellious child. That situation that's just so beyond you and keeps you up at night, you can't even sleep. He knows it all. Oh, that he would, out of his, out of his fullness, pour out a knowledge of his will into our lives. Colossians 2.10 that you could be filled in him who is head over all rule and authority. We, we just have so many helpful things here that the, the Lord means for us to learn here. And what I want to just reflect on for a second here then is this. Your life lacks joy a lot. And I would say that part of it's our own fault, largely because we look to be filled by those things that are just temporary. Right? Right? I just, I, I, I need joy. I'll be happy if, if just everybody notices me. And then it happens and poof, it's gone. Or the compliments that I get or the Facebook likes or the Instagram like, like I, I, just, I just need those affirmations and then they come and then they're gone and then you want more. Maybe you have a particular achievement that you've worked a long time on and you finally achieved it but it's become your identity. And only when people just notice you do you feel that you have joy. Or maybe it's a possession that you had. Or maybe you wanted your team to win and they won and it's so exciting. And then and these things are temporary because either you lose them or you actually keep them, but they don't keep paying the dividends they paid before. It was, made me really happy when that first happened and now it's just so-so. And the promise of this text is that you have a full one who will continue to fill you. He fills you with what your creator knows will make you eat enduringly happy, right? The earth can only give you the things that make you happy for short periods of time, and your creator knows more of what you need than you even know. And he can give you that which will make your joy last. Jesus then was given to us who are the church to fill us with the good things of God. From him, again, let me just remind you of what we just covered a minute ago. He can give you righteousness. From his fullness, he can give you a knowledge of God's will. From his fullness, he can give you joy. From his fullness, he can give you peace. From his fullness, he can fill you with the fullness of God. So that we, being filled with these joy-giving blessings, have enduring joy. So you, if you know you lack joy, and you know yourself to be empty, 
Know that God has given you one who is able to fill you and he's ready to fill you right now. Too many people don't want what God has to give, by the way. They'll walk right out of here and go right back to the temporary things. You'll just ignore the Lord. But if you find yourself now to have been guilty of these things, repent of your sinfulness. Repent of seeking your fullness in some other way. Admit the foolishness of going after other things to make you happy when you know only the Lord can do it and He is full and ready to fill you. Pray that He would give you a heart that longs for the sort of fullness that only He can give. A second interpretation of this phrase is that the church itself is the fullness of God. This one I won't spend much time on. It's a little bit of a challenge to understand, perhaps. But we ourselves are the fullness of God. The best way to explain this is to say that uh, Jesus is the head who redeems his body. And when only a few of those he means to redeem are redeemed, then it's not a full body yet. It's just, you know, part of a body. And so once we are all... Once, once those he means to save our safe, we become the fullness. We are his fullness. We are his full body. This is part of the logic of this understanding. And then what we say is that Jesus is the one who fills all in all, which really means he fills heaven and earth with himself. Since we are his body, he fills the earth with us. In this sense, our going into the world as the church is the going forth of Christ into all things. This idea has too much for us, I think, to comprehend, but Jesus fills heaven and earth with his rule and authority, and part of him going and filling everything with himself is him filling the world with his body that is the church, and we play an important part in representing Christ in this world, and this has implications for evangelism and just you living a salt and life in this world and many other things. We must move on to the conclusion. The conclusion then is that our study has focused on God's power toward us who believe. We've been asking ourselves, why would God give so much power toward you and toward me? And we've seen that this does amazing things. This power that God has, it works for your spiritual good. It works for your spiritual joy. And I want to address two groups of people here. First is an unbeliever. If you're an unbeliever today and you've heard about this joy that we're talking about, know that this joy can be for you. It can. You can have enduring joy. And yet it will never be for you if you're not connected to Jesus Christ who's the head. This joy will never come. So for you, if you are not a believer, if you've not repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ, the call for you is to repent of your sins and believe in him. And have Jesus be the head, the one who, to whom you're connected to, who can give you the nourishment that your soul needs to be spiritually healthy. It, it is, it's all available, but it can only come to you if you're united to Christ by faith. And if you have any questions about what I'm talking about here, I'd love to talk with you after the service more about this. Yeah, if you are a believer, how are you supposed to think about this power of God toward you? This is a perennial question for Christians. What are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do, Pastor? I mean, you told me to do it. What am I supposed to do? And two people, people fall into one of two categories. They say, well, you know, you, you've got to do everything. Everything depends on you. And the, on the other hand, people say, well, no, 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 it's not us. It's him. Let go and let God. And you just kind of sit back and wait for his power to just waft over you while you just, you know, are laying on the bed tranquilly waiting for this to happen. And I think a better Bible answer is Philippians 2, 12, and 13, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Look, God calls us to act. Right? He calls you to fight against your sin. He calls you to grow in the knowledge of God and to get into the meat of the word. He calls you to be useful in helping other Christians grow. And again, many of you are thinking, I could never do that. And I would just say, yes, you never could. 
Christ in you, you can. We're not talking about what you could do on your own. We're talking about what, what God can do in and through you. I see so many discouraged faces sometimes when I say, you could help other people grow like that. And they're like, you're like, no, you don't know. I never could. And I'm like, you're thinking of yourself too much. Don't you believe God's power? He can work through any of us. When we come to proclaiming the gospel to unbelievers, again, many people say, I could never do that. Well, again, I'm not talking about what you can do. I'm talking about what God, who is infinitely powerful, can do through you. We can do the very things that we feel inadequate to do and afraid to do and the things that we want to make excuses for so we don't even really feel guilty about not doing it anymore. We just make some sort of excuse. I couldn't do that. I could never learn that. I could never be like that. So... I'll go back to happily not doing what God wants me to do. But we must not. Instead, we must consider God's mighty power toward you. And just walk forward in obedience. Submit your body, your members as instruments for righteousness. Open your word and... Open God's word and fill your mind with his word and then pray that God by his mighty power will bless you offering yourself up to him and you wanting to walk in him, walk with him closely and open up to the fact that he could then at that very moment powerfully work in you and through you to bless people in ways that you never have and you never thought was possible. I'm praying that many of us, even all of us, will respond to this sermon in exactly that way. Pray. Thank you, God, for your mighty power. The Christian life is never about what we can do and, and, and our gifts and, and, and mainly what we can do by ourselves. And too often we as Christians fall into excuse making. And God, we pray that you would guard us from that. We pray that this incredible truth that your power is toward us. You mean to mature us beyond what we ever thought we could be, what we ever thought we could know. The, the usefulness, more useful in helping other Christians grow than we ever thought. More useful in proclaiming the gospel in our community than we ever thought. Lord God, teach us to take our eyes off of ourselves and to just marvel at your mighty power and say, I can't trust in me, but I can and I will trust in this mighty God who has mightily saved my soul and works, means to work mightily through my life to do his work in this church, in my family, in my community. Stir us up, God. Stir us up. May we not be content with merely coming to church week by week and perhaps watching others do some things for you. Impress on our hearts that you mean to use us and give us faith to believe that you powerfully can do that, not because of us, but because of you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.